stage four colon cancer when she's under 50 years old and has two kids. This is the book of Ecclesiastes. Like, why would a good God let that happen? This is in the book of Ecclesiastes. And then Kohelet, the teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes, just goes full on and says, I think everything's meaningless. I don't think there's any meaning at all in the world. Prove it. Prove that there's meaning. So when we have these little controversies on Christian Twitter about whether or not deconstruction is a, is a good or bad thing, I don't get it because I just want to say, open your Bible, guys. Like, it's in the Bible. It's baked in to our sacred ancient texts. You can, I think what God's doing by including the book of Ecclesiastes into the canon is saying you can ask these questions. It's normal and human to ask these kinds of questions, to have these kinds of struggles, to have a friend get diagnosed with cancer and say, what the actual, it's okay. But because, because deconstruction is kind of a taboo thing, I said, I'm not going to title the sermon anything about deconstruction. So then I thought, maybe I'll call this sermon pyrotheology. Now, those of you who don't know the, the Irish philosopher who I was going to name this after, uh, there's an Irish philosopher who has this kind of way of, this faith tradition. He's, I would say he's a Christian. Some, many, some would say he's not. But he, he made up this term called pyrotheology, which just basically is his way of saying, I want, to, I want a faith tradition in which I embody. It's more about embodying or living out my faith rather than a set of beliefs about the world. Christianity, this, this person, this philosopher would say that Christianity should be more about how you live in the world rather than what you believe about it. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus is doing here. But pyrotheology, I don't want to plagiarize too much. Pastors plagiarize all the time. I try not to, so we're not calling this pyrotheology, even though I really want to. So this sermon title I settled on for the, the message this morning is Religious Demolition. <laughs> Religious Demolition, because that, friends, Forrest already gave it away. We're going to be in the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is one of the most familiar, famous stories in all of the Bible. I mean, it's so famous that it's become kind of a cultural epithet, this term, Oh, the, I, w I was a good Samaritan today, like, right? We, we're so familiar with this story that I want to say it's lost a lot of its meaning. It's within familiar stories like this that there's this subversive, kind of scandalous message within this story of the good Samaritan that we're going to get we're going we're gonna to look under the hood a little bit of this really familiar parable. We're in this series where I'm just going through parables. See, because I think there's magic and gold in the parables of Jesus. These, these parables turned the religious world that Jesus existed in upside down. Religious demolition. See, within this parable, Jesus is destroyed. Destroying and demolishing common spiritual understandings and practices and sensibilities. Friends, there's a reason why Jesus is so scandalous, Jesus is so subversive, Jesus is so radical in the religious, in the churchy world of his day, but we've anesthetized him so much. There's a reason that Jesus had to say things like, Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. You remember that? Matthew 5. Don't think that I've come to abolish all of the scriptures. Why did Jesus say that? Because people thought he came to abolish the scriptures. He was talking in such an unfamiliar, different, subversive, radical kind of way. People's natural thoughts and inclinations was, this guy's come, and come to completely dismantle our faith tradition. And Jesus would say, 
No, I've actually got the heart of it. I've actually got the core of it. And you just never knew. Because you made this thing about all of the rules and regulations and laws. That was never what this was about. And this is why I can say and pray like I did earlier, this never gets old. Jesus never gets old to me. So let's, let's read this ancient story, the story that was told 2,000 years ago, and we're still thinking and theorizing about it today. This is Luke 10. Luke 10, starting in verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus. We had just, we've just spent last weekend, Easter weekend, thinking about, or the weekend before on Palm Sunday, about lawyers and experts in the law testing Jesus time after time after the triumphal entry. This, that wasn't a unique thing. It was happening all the time. On one occasion, Luke said, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's an interesting question. I want to stop there, but we're going to keep going. What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The lawyer answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So here's the aside first. It seems as if this lawyer was familiar with Jesus. Because a couple of weeks ago, when we were in the triumphal entry, the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus, and they said, what was the question? What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? And he gave this exact same answer. I think that this guy here, I, this was not confirmed by, by biblical scholars, this is Randy Nye's guess. I think that this guy has been following Jesus. I think this guy's familiar with Jesus, even because of the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But I'm going to get to that in a second. But I think this guy's familiar with Jesus. I think this guy, he's answering questions from Jesus like Jesus would have answered them. And he's asking questions like Jesus would have answered them, asked them. I don't think he got that on his own. Let's go back to the beginning. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? That's just such a great question. You could go, that guy could have gone so many different ways, but he answers it the way Jesus would have. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. There's so much subversive stuff in here, I can barely contain myself, but I got to keep going so we can see the whole thing. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Man. In reply, Jesus said, let me tell you a story. There was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. Now, that's just geographically correct. Jerusalem was, I, I forget exactly how high. I want to say 3,500 3, feet above sea level. And when you would go out of Jerusalem, you would always go down and down to Jericho. And the, that, that road was, the way to, from Jerusalem to Jericho was fraught with with robbers with bandits. I mean, it was a dangerous, dangerous situation to walk from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's just a normal thing. Man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where, where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He had compassion on him, in other words. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured, oil on, his, poured on oil and wine. I know somebody's going to be thinking about essential oils. I know it. <laughs> he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man... The man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus is just giving them this, this picture of this, this reckless generosity. See, because when you had an open-ended agreement with an innkeeper like this, it just made you wide open for being extorted. 
This guy doesn't care, though. Overcharge me if you want, but I want this guy to be taken care of. I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three, Jesus said, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. It's just a no-brainer. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, there's a number of things Jesus is demolishing here in this little brief story, this little subversive story in answering this religious, this legal expert, this lawyer's question. And the first thing is this pyrotheology idea. Pyrotheology, this idea that Christianity should be, this way of Jesus, following Jesus, should be more about the way we live in the world rather than what we believe about the world. But we don't do that. Here, to put another less sensationalized terms, Jesus here is talking about and getting at this debate within Christianity about what's more important, orthodoxy or orthopraxy? Are those words familiar with anyone? Orthodoxy or orthopraxy? Orthodoxy is what, if you're a good, you know, recovering evangelical like I am, Orthodoxy was what we, like, we, we, we went all in on orthodoxy. I mean, if, like, I, 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 I felt called to ministry in the college years. I, I, I stepped over on 10th and Wisconsin, Calvary Presbyterian, Elmbrook Church's college age ministry was happening in the basements, and there was this guy named Dave Lutz who was the pastor. In the first sermon I heard him give, I said, I want to do that for the rest of my life. So I'm a good church guy gave my life to it, that that moment changed my life. And the way we college kids, Christian college kids, would spend our time was we would go to the Av on Tuesday nights, and then we would go to Jalisco's, which I don't even think is open anymore over across the street from St. Mary's. It is open still? All right. We would go to Jalisco's over what people say is bad Mexican food. I don't think bad Mexican food exists. I don't care if it's made of horses. They, said, they used to say it was made of horses, the meat. I don't care. It was delicious. <laughs> now I'm going to get canceled because of that. <laughs> Sheesh. But we would, we would go post-ministry night. We would go to Lisco's, eat a ginormous burrito, and debate whether you can lose your faith or not. Now, or we'd debate whether free will or predestination is more scriptural. Or we'd debate who's in and who's out. Is anyone else like me where you, would, you spent long hours over coffee, tea, and Mexican food as a college-age Christian debating over the stuff because we were so fascinated and riveted by it? And we made the whole of our faith, I did, or the stuff, the doctrine, the orthodoxy. And I love debating about atonement theories and all sorts of this stuff. And I think if Jesus walked through that Mexican restaurant and heard this group of college kids debating about all this orthodoxy, he would keep walking. That's not my table. See, I think Jesus would go probably back to the kitchen and hang out. But we like to make this whole thing about orthodoxy and getting really precise, really tight what we believe and, and the doctrines and the order of it and what's the most important. And, and if I'm going to go to a church, it's going to be because that church has the best statement of faith that I agree with 100%. Jesus, I don't think, cared at all about it. I, I've been talking about belief not mattering as much as what we do a lot, and it's not because I didn't select this, this parable because it had this message in it. I just selected it because it was a great parable, a famous one that we should probably dig into. And then I see this, and I'm like, Jesus is saying this again. Don't blame me for being a broken record. Blame Jesus. I think Jesus cares way more about our orthopraxy. Orthopraxy means how you live. Orthopraxy means take all that you believe, does it actually affect the way you live in real life? 
church people, we're the ones who usually get this wrong. We're the ones who usually, I'm, I'm looking at a good number of you. you, many of you are here more often than not, and I'm really grateful that you are, because I need people to talk to on Sunday morning. But the challenge is, is that you guys who are here more often than not, typically, are the ones who get this wrong. We like to get our theology correct. We like to get our doctrine in order. And Jesus here is saying, doesn't matter. Now, where is Jesus saying it? First thing in the, in the question. I said I wanted to stop at the question that the, the, the legal expert asked. He said, Jesus, what must I believe to inherit eternal life? caught it. What must I believe to inherit eternal life? That's not the question, actually. The religious leader, the, 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 the legal expert, the lawyer asks, what must I do, Jesus, to inherit eternal life? Now, all of us who grew up in the church and had those late night Mexican dinner uh, debates should know that instantly Jesus should say, first of all, your question is really just backwards. Because all of our righteousness is like filthy rags, buddy. And so you can do, nothing you can do can get you eternal life, right? That's the Christian correct, correct thing. Like Jesus should have corrected the dude. No, there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. Jesus doesn't do that. See, I think this guy asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Partially because he knew that that's how Jesus thought. Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 no. First of all, you've got to believe correctly in order to inherit eternal life. Then we'll talk about the rest. Jesus just goes along with the question. He says, what does the law say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly. That's how you inherit eternal life is what Jesus is saying. If you live like that. Jesus is demolishing our idea of how you get in. What's most important to God? Is it this set of beliefs that I hold that's really close to perfect? Or is it embodying this way of Jesus? If you fast forward in the sermon, and we'll hit, hit it at the end, but I, it's just another example of this theology of just this religious demolition of Jesus, demolishing our idea of how you get eternal life. Jesus said, which of these three was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The religious expert replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and believe likewise. Have I proven my point yet? Go and do likewise. Jesus is turning our religious he was turning this world's religious sensibilities on its head, and he's doing the same thing for us. I hope. If we're taking Jesus seriously, he, he will be turning your religious world and sensibilities on its head, demolishing those old models. question is, are we really listening? Second thing that Jesus is demolishing, like Beulah, thank you, you got up there, is Jesus is demolishing our religious hierarchies and sensibilities. Demolishing our religious hierarchies and sensibilities. Now, this is obvious within the story. Jesus has three central people within the story. A priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. Now, priests and Levites were at the top of the religious food chain. They were the gatekeepers. They were the most important people within ancient Judaism. They would be coming back from Jerusalem because they had just performed their temple duty. These were the important guys. These were the Andy Stanleys, the Brian McLarens, the, the John Pipers, the John MacArthurs. These were the gatekeepers. These were the important people, and they pass by this man who was half dead on the side of the road. And what's more is their religion probably most likely would have said, you should pass by this guy. We don't have the, we, 
There's these extra books of the Bible that Catholics have in their Bible, Orthodox Christians have in their Bible. We call the Apocrypha. There's all sorts of interesting things in the Apocrypha. One of the books of the Apocrypha is the wisdom of Sirach. And in Sirach 12, Sirach is a book, is a wisdom literature, ancient Jewish wisdom literature, which was written in probably the late second century BC, but it was authoritative to, these, to this Jewish world. And let's go to Sirach 12. This is the first, this is, this is a fun, this is the first time I've ever quoted from the Apocrypha in a sermon. This is Sirach Start chapter 12, starting in verse 1. When you do a good deed, make sure that you know who is benefiting from it. Listen to these words. When you do a good deed, make sure you know who is benefiting from it. Then what you do will not be wasted. You will be repaid for any kindness you show to a devout person. If he doesn't repay you, the most high will. That's kind of the theology of the day. No good ever comes to a person who gives comfort to the wicked. It is not a righteous act. Give to the religious people, but don't help sinners. Do good to humble people, but don't give anything to those who are not devout. Don't give them food, or they will use your kindness against you. (laughs) This is just like modern-day theology. Every good thing you do for such people will bring you twice as much trouble in return. The Most High himself hates sinners, and he will punish them. And lastly, give to good people, but do not help sinners. So, friends... This is the religious text of the day. And in probably over half the Christians in the world, this is in their Bible, their holy text. Do good to devout religious people. But sinners, people who don't know God, stay away. There's no good in it for you. It's a matter of fact, it's going to cost you something that you don't want to spend. This is the religious world of Jesus' day. And so as he says, the Levite and the priest who were religious power holders of the day, not because of what they did or or what they believed, but, but because of birth. They were born into these positions. And when it said that they passed by this person on the side of the road who was half dead, they would say, yeah, of course they did. Sirach 12, 1 through 7. And Jesus would say, Sirach 12 has it all wrong. See, Jesus intentionally doesn't specify who this person was who was was beaten and robbed by bandits. We have no idea of their identity, whether they're Jewish, whether they're Gentile, whether they're pagan. We don't know. We we, we have no idea whether they're that righteous person or that sinful person, quote, unquote. And Jesus wants it that way, it seems like. To give us, this, his listeners, this quinundrum, what are you going to do? And then the third character is this Samaritan person. Now, I don't have time this morning to go into all the details of why Jewish people and Samaritan people hated each other. But suffice it to say, they did. So much so that if you just go back, if you just look, in, if you have your Bible along with you, like I'm reading from my Bible in, in Luke 9, Jesus and the disciples are about to walk through a Samaritan village. They reject, that Samaritan village rejects Jesus. And what do the disciples ask if Jesus wants to do? Would you like us to call down hellfire from heaven to burn those people to a crisp? Not being sarcastic. They hated him. And this is the person that Jesus said is embodying the covenant's God named Yahweh from the Old Testament. Now, just to try to get jarring enough with this, for some of us, Jesus would say, there was a pastor and a denominational leader, they passed by on the other side of the road. I've passed by on the other side of the road countless amount of times. But then for half of us, it was, Jesus would say, and then there was this anarchist, communist, black trans woman wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt. And she went and, and cared for that person who was half dead on the side of the road and spent a whole lot of money 
took, her, took this person to the hospital and said, I'll do what, I'll pay, they don't have health insurance, I'll get the bill. Yes, I know that's going to be thousands of dollars. I got it. It's on, it's on me. Because this person, this black trans, Black Lives Matter person was moved with compassion. Or to the other half of us, I don't know this, the direct proportions, but Jesus would be telling the story and they would, he would say, there was this really cool hipster pastor who was subversive and radical. He passed by on the other side. And then there was other female church leader. She passed by on the other side. And then there was this person who was wearing a MAGA hat and was there on January 6th at the Capitol in the insurrection and still believes that the election was stolen and is a QAnon supporter. And they went to that person and loved him because they were moved by compassion. And they took him to the hospital and said, yep, I know it's going to be thousands of dollars, and I don't support that government socialized health care anyways, but I, it's on me. Whatever the bill is, I don't care. I will pay for it. And I'm going to come back. I've got, I've got a political rally to go to, but I'm going to come back next week, and I'm going to make sure that you've taken care of this person because that's just the kind of person I try to embody. Are you challenged yet? Jesus is turning the religious sensibilities on his head. He said, I don't care what friggin' hat you wear. I don't care who you vote for. That's going to get me in trouble. I don't care about the platforms you, you hold. I don't care what news channel you watch. I care how you live. I care about whether or not you embody this way rather than what po your political affiliation is. Jesus is demolishing our religious, righteous, self-righteous ways and worldviews. Last thing here. Now we come to the kicker. This Four words of Jesus, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So Jesus, at the end of this story that he tells, it's this brilliant way of talking about who is my neighbor. When, when the religious, when the, when the legal expert comes to Jesus and asks him this question and says, who is my neighbor? What this religious person is asking is a question that we ask all the time. Basically, it's, who don't I have to love? Who don't I have to consider my neighbor? That's what Jesus, that's what the guy's asking. And it's within the, the, the Old Testament, within the Leviticus 19, where this guy gets his answer of love your neighbor as yourself. Right within there, God says, hey, take care of the alien and the foreigner among you. But what re, biblical scholars would say that, that there's this condition or asterisk within that statement that says if they are part of the covenant people, if they've converted to Judaism, take care of them as if you're one of their own. There's a limit to neighborliness. There's a limit to who's my neighbor. In, in, in ancient Jerusalem, this was a really important question because Jerusalem was a melting pot at this point. The ancient Jews would have loved for it to be this place of purity where only Jewish people are, but that's not the reality. The reality was is that in this day, it was becoming more and more diverse. There were Hellenistic people, or in other words, Greek people coming in, some adopting the Jewish faith, some not, but just living in Jerusalem. Then there were the Romans, the Roman occupiers. And the, so R Jerusalem itself was full of people who were, by proximity, your neighbors, but in practice, anything but. And they would know full well, those Romans, those Greek people, those Gentiles are not worthy of this kind. They, they're not considered my neighbor. They're not worthy of this kind of love and self-sacrifice. Who is my neighbor? Who do I get to exclude is the question, right? So Jesus turns it on his head, says, which one is being the best neighbor? The religious expert has no choice but to say the Samaritan, the one that we hate, the one that... We're, we've been opposed to for half a millennia. That's the one. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. So here's the deal. The, the religious 
experts, the, the legal experts, he answers the question correctly. He agrees with Jesus. For most of us evangelicals, that would mean you've got it. Eternal life is yours, buddy. You thought in your head, you reason, you agree with Jesus, you believe that that guy's the neighbor. Good job! You've got it. Jesus doesn't end there. He doesn't say, go and keep that belief ironclad in your head, hold to it, and you'll never lose your salvation. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Story over. See, this parable is open-ended. We don't know if the legal expert actually did reorient his life around this belief that was just turned upside down. Holy cow. Everyone around me is my neighbor. And the way to inherit eternal life, the way to be a, 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 a person of the covenant community of Yahweh is to embody this way and to live in such a way that scandalously and self-sacrificially loves the people around me in my workplace, in my neighborhood, in my family, no matter who they voted for, no matter what conspiracy theories they agree with, no matter what liberal wokeness they, they, they spout, no matter any of it. They're all my neighbor. And to live into, in a way that's going to inherit eternal life is a way that embodies the way of this covenant God, this, commu- this kingdom of God. We don't know if the religious expert, the legal expert did it. We know he agreed in his head, but Jesus said it doesn't matter. So this is again that moment, friends. You can feel it. I'm coming to the end of my sermon. What's your choice? Is this going to be more intellectual agreement? Or are we going to actually reorient our lives to spend ourselves on behalf of our neighbors, which is every single person you encounter. Last week, if you were here on Easter Sunday, we had a good time. And I, I was uh, poking fun at my former self and other pastor friends by saying that um, I was going to be on a Zoom call last week. And at this last week, it was next week. And us pastors, with about 12, 10 or 12 pastors, and I said, I promise you, we're going to ask the question, the question, first question that's going to be asked is, how was your Easter? And we're going to go around the Zoom call, and we're going to all answer. And I promise you, the, the, that's translated is, how many people did you have, and how many bells and whistles did you pull out to have a successful Easter? Monday night, I'm hanging with some friends, and I get a text from one of these pastors who said, hey, I was watching your sermon on Facebook And I like what you had to say about our Zoom call coming up in two days. (laughs) And I literally texted him in all caps, BUSTED! (laughs) And he said, you're absolutely right. Measuring the success of Easter by numbers is a really bad way to go. And then I was given trouble the whole Zoom call because of what I said. But I meant it. And so when we we did the thing, we went around and asked, how was your Easter? And my answer was to be determined. I don't know how how our Easter Sunday went. Because here's what's going to determine how our Easter Sunday was successful or not. Will Will Bruce City Church embody the way of the resurrection? Will Bruce City Church, will the individuals and com- collective who make up this church family, will they actually embody the crucifixion of Christ, loving and forgiving those who are persecuting them as, they're, as it's happening? Will they live that out? If so, we had a good Easter Sunday. If not, it was meaningless. And that's the same thing that Jesus is saying here. Good religious legal expert, I'm glad you agree with me. That's not what this is about. The success of whether this parable worked for Jesus was whether this guy actually reoriented and changed his life and lived his life for the people around him. No matter who they, it was, no matter how much he was hated, no matter how much how excluded a person was, you just owe them your love if you're walking in the way of Jesus. 
You don't pass by on the other side of the road. You don't go for the most convenient, comfortable option. You're here to love. That's what it looks like to embody the Imago Dei. That's what it looks like to walk in the way of Jesus. So friends, whether or not this message hit the mark, you don't have to tell me afterwards as you're leaving. Whether or not we actually reorient our lives, that's the money. That's, that's what we're looking for here. So Holy Spirit, band, come on up. People, congregation, let's stand up. Let's do the things that we normally do. And I just want to open myself, open my heart and my spirit, my inner man to you, Holy Spirit. I would say search me, but I know what you're going to find. A guy who talks a better game than he lives. and do likewise. That's all, that's just, that's just my prayer, Jesus. Would you help us embody the way of this religious outsider and enemy of the religion? Would you help us embody the way of this reject? You help us embody your way, Jesus. What if, what if Bruce City Church could become more known by what we do than what we believe and what we say? What if, what if Bruce City Church was known for embodying this way of Jesus that says, a new commandment I give you, love one another. Come and do something miraculous and supernatural in me, in us as individuals, in, a, in us as a, as a church. Help us embody that way, Jesus. It would take a miracle. But see, I'm still charismatic enough to, know, to believe that you can do miracles. That you can call a people to yourself in such a radical, scandalous way that they say, I don't care what, what our reputation is, I just care that we love people. I don't care what we get kicked out of, I don't care what we get excluded by, who we get excluded by, who we get, who leaves. We're just going to embody this way of Jesus. Come and lead us into life, Jesus. Give us the courage enough to do it. And so now we worship you one more time because what else can we do? Amen. stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for it. Far and wide, but I know we're all searching.
searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am because you're perfect in all of your ways you are perfect Thank you for coming out this morning, and uh, if you are new visiting with us this morning, I want to encourage you to stop back at the tables, grab a Bruce City Church MKE mug. Uh, there'll be someone there that can talk to you a little bit more. We'd love to get to know you, to uh, introduce yourself to those around you, and, um, and uh, this morning and this week, I encourage you to go and do likewise with these words from 1 Thessalonians. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as our do ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen. <laughs>